All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is Friday, November 29th, in the year of our Lord, 2024. And the subject I want to talk about today is the collapse of evangelicalism. The fading of the gospel. So let's start with the scripture, since this is thinking biblically, and we find the gospel in the scripture, not in someone's personal revelations, which is part of the collapse, by the way. So let's turn over to Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 15. And of course, of the probably the most two important bo- um, the two most important uh, books in the New Testament in the Bible as a whole is the Gospel of John and the Epistle to the Romans. Certainly, the others are very important, but the Gospel of John reveals Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Son of God, who died for the sins of the world, and that salvation is by faith in Him. His, out of his own mouth. And the epistle to the Romans, the letter to the church in Rome, gives us an understanding of God's purpose and the gospel. So let's uh, take a look here. Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 15. So as much as it's in me, now let me give you a little forward here. Paul had had been seeking to visit the church in Rome, but he had not yet been able to, so he's writing this extensive uh, letter to share with them some essential truths about the gospel. Uh, um, And Paul is uh, unique. He wrote a very large segment of the New Testament, uh, and his books are the core of Christian theology. There's Christians today that that want to reject Paul because they want to go back to uh, the Old Testament. But yeah, there's a Hebrewist movement and there's, you know, wannabe uh, Jews out there. Well, there is no salvation in Judaism. Judaism is is explicitly hostile to Jesus Christ. Islam is actually much closer to Christianity than Judaism because Islam accepts that Jesus is perhaps the greatest of all the uh, of all the prophets that he did miracles that essentially he, it, it admits he was uh, uh, born of a virgin he uh, ascended to heaven his he was uh, there's no mention of his sin uh, born of Mary doesn't name a father Although the uh, the information that they have about Jesus is limited, it uh, the Quran bears witness to the to the gospel, the evangel, the what they call the Injil, which would be the entire New Testament, really. And uh, well, the problem is uh, uh, that the, they don't accept him as the Son of God, and they do not understand the cross and why Jesus had to die. There is no equivalent in the Quran of God's law, although the Quran mentions the revelation given to Moses. It's just that Muslims aren't familiar with these things, just like they have not read the Injil. Uh, it may change their understanding. So there are some things in the Quran that a Christian could look at and say, well, you know, you could, if you interpret it properly. I don't believe that... Uh, um, Muhammad was a uh, prophet in the same manner as, as of course, not, not anywhere near equal to Christ. Also, by the way, uh, uh, Islam teaches that Jesus is returning. doesn't say Muhammad is returning, I don't believe. It says Jesus is returning. 
uh, to judge. So uh, obviously there was at least some influence from Christianity at that time. Um, uh, Mecca, where Muhammad originates from, he was a caravan, a caravan merchant. Uh, he married a, uh, a widow, an older widow that was uh, uh, wealthy. Uh, and he, as a, as a carav caravan merchant, he would have traveled and encountered both Judaism and uh, Christianity in the Arabian Peninsula because there were both there already. But Mecca itself was thoroughly paganized. But Muhammad became a preacher. That's safe to call him a preacher or a prophet proclaiming the one true God, the God of Abraham. So um, Islam, uh, Muslims worship, explicitly worship the God of Abraham, as do Jews, well, the ones that are religious at least. However, uh, Judaism explicitly rejects Jesus Christ, uh, whereas Islam does not. So just to give a little uh, bit on that, uh, you know, America, we are so captive to the Zionists, including uh, in aberrant Christian doctrine among evangelicals and dispensationalism, that we do not see things as they truly are. And Christians, if you have not received lo the love of the truth, you're not a Christian. Without loving the truth, you cannot be saved. So, And God himself, Jesus Christ himself, is the truth. <clears throat> In case you don't know that, uh, Judaism has been the greatest enemy of Christianity from the beginning. Not communism, not paganism, but Judaism. Does not mean that God does not intend to save, but there'll be a remnant that will be saved. There's already been a remnant saved. All the early Christians were Jewish, of course. But we have to realize the truth of, mat of the matters and not... Uh, there, there's been, been a open idolatry of uh, the Jewish people among evangelicals and fundamentalists for way too long, uh, dating back to John Darby in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, it's anti We don't want to be anti-Semites. Of course, the, the Arabs are Semites also, but just against people because of their ethnicity, or, but look at, upon the, the, the Jewish people. Of course, you don't have to be ethnically Jew, a Jew to be hold to that religious system. But realize it is a system that cannot save. Uh, compassion requires us to proclaim the gospel to them, as to Muslims, as to atheists, everybody else. But if people refuse to listen, uh, Jesus said, leave them alone. If they want to argue about it, leave them alone. If they, they become hardened, leave them alone. They have rejected the light. That's in, it's in God's hands. Salvation comes from God. It doesn't come from man. So Paul writes here, starting at verse 15, So as much as it's in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Of course, the Rome was the center of, uh, the city of Rome was the center of the Roman Empire, which was in the entire Mediterranean area and beyond. Uh, it didn't go as far as Persia, but it was uh, the entire Mediterranean basin was part of the Roman Empire. Up in up as far as well encroaching on Germany, France was was what modern day France was uh, part of the Roman Empire. Um, Britain sort of it was moving that direction. It would get up as far as Germany, and there's where the Romans met their nemesis. They lost a couple legions up there, I think. But uh, uh, then, by the time of Constantine, uh, the capital of Rome actually moved east to Constantinople, modern Istanbul uh, on the uh, in Turkey. Uh, so here we have this is going on here. I to. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the, the good news. It's a special type of good news, the good news of God's victory, God's victory over sin and death, in fact. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes or trusts. 
Uh, the, the word here, pistis, cannot be separated from trust. It's not a simple ascensus to facts, like the Roman Catholics to say. No, it is fiduciary. It is a, a, a thing of trusting in Christ, not just believing facts about his life, believing even that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The fact of the resurrection is not sufficient to save. It is trusting in the resurrection of Christ. There are lots of people that will accept the facts, but they do not they are not committed to the person. They do not trust in the person of Jesus Christ, which is what evangelicalism is supposed to be all about. When I became a, a true born-again Christian back in the early 70s, well, not early, come to think of it, it's 1976, mid-70s. It was at the tail end of what's called the Jesus Revolution. Uh, it was not really part of that, but the Holy Spirit was moving in people's lives around the world. There were there were quite a few of us uh, uh, in the Air Force, uh, at Minot Air Force Base, or at least a, enough for a, uh, a large handful of us that, uh, that had been touched by God, called by God, out of church backgrounds, out of other backgrounds, but God had chose us for himself. He drew us to himself. And we knew. We, we knew God. We were pretty ignorant about a lot of things. But we knew we were saved. We knew we belonged to Christ. We knew he died for our sins. And we trusted in him. And uh, the churches that we grew up in, they didn't know what to do with us. Uh, never did learn how to de deal with us. Uh, I was raised as a Lutheran, a midstream Lutheran, midstream going apostate, it turned out. But uh, as far as that denomination merged with uh, the, the most liberal of, and largest of them all and went completely. <clears throat> but uh, Lutheranism is Catholic light. It is sacramentalism. It just doesn't have the Pope and all the all the traditions, but certainly as the Reformation in general, other than the Anabaptists, the uh, uh, Reformation in general was simply reformed Roman Catholicism, which is somewhat removed from Orthodoxy because they split about, what, 1053? So, yeah, there's a difference. But here we have, so Paul is writing to proclaim the gospel to the church that already existed in Rome. It wasn't established by apostles. It was established by other Christians, took the gospel to Rome. So Paul is going to bring in the apostolic message to them. A tradition says that Peter uh, later traveled to Rome and died there. Both Paul and Peter were martyred in Rome. Paul was, because he was a Roman citizen, was uh, executed by beheading. Peter was not, and he was crucified. He requested to be crucified upside down, according to tradition, because he didn't consider himself worthy of dying the same way his Savior had. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, the Jew first in temporal sequence. It begins from the Jews, and then with the conversion of Cornelius, with Peter, God having to convince him. Uh, the gospel was uh, surprisingly to the, the apostles and to everybody else, the gospel was for the Gentiles also. He is granting regen uh, Gentiles repentance and salvation also beginning with a, a Roman centurion who was not hostile to the Jewish people either, but he was, uh, uh, he was not uh, a convert. But he was looking to God for salvation, and God met him, sent the apostle Peter to proclaim the gospel to him and his household. For it is the power of God, the power of God, Unto salvation 
for everyone who believes, everyone who trusts in Christ. Verse 17, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. I'm sorry I can't quite explain that. It is, uh, it is literally what it says, or from faithfulness to faith would be another way to interpret it, from the faithfulness of God, perhaps. It's just not quite clear. Sometimes when God does things like that, it's because it's, there's multiple things being compressed into that statement there. But it's all about faith. God's faithfulness, same word, pistis, and faith in God, same word, same word, same word. It can be translated either way. For uh, as it is written, now this is Paul, a condensation of this entire epistle, this short expression here, which is a quote from the Old Testament prophets, the just shall live by faith. It doesn't say you'll just simply, it's not just an experience, it's not a momentary belief, it's you shall live by faith. It's a lifestyle, living by trusting in Christ, trusting in God. Then it goes on to for the others, for the for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And he says, because what may be known of God is manifest in them or among them, for God has shown to them, what? By creation. So he said, all men are guilty because all men have a knowledge of God's existence. And what do they do with it? They suppress that knowledge. They hide, as in the garden. When they heard God walking in the garden after they had sinned, they hid themselves, and human beings have been doing that ever since. It takes God's word to grab your attention and draw you to Christ. He has to convict you of your sin. He has to, because you try to cover your sins, as they did in the garden with fig leaves. Fig leaves aren't sufficient to cover your sins. It requires Jesus crucified to cover your sins. The one sacrifice that actually does take away the sin of the world. Nothing else. Animal sacrifices are just an illustration. That are, and they're no longer valid. They're no longer valid. Even if the crazies in Jerusalem should rebuild that temple, not a single offering would be accepted by God, but be condemned by him as an abomination. Because Christ came and died, he completed the once-for-all sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. But it's for everyone who believes. It's not because Christ accomplished what is necessary, but we must trust in that. God has ordained trust as the means of receiving God's grace, God's favor, God's salvation. Perhaps because in the garden, it was the lack of trust, Adam's lack of trust in God, Eve's lack of trust in God that brought sin and death upon the entire human race. So it would not be uh, unusual that God would require trust. If, we had, if Adam and Eve had trusted in God rather than believing the devil, Things would have been different. Let's take a look at another verse here. So we find that the gospel is the thing. The message of the gospel and the message of salvation by faith, trust in God, in Christ, in what Christ did on the cross. 1 Corinthians, also written by the Apostle Paul. We're start, going to start at verse 11 here. <clears throat> For it has been declared uh, to me, excuse me, sometimes I try to quote the King James, has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those who are of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Contentions. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, another well-known teacher, perhaps the author of the book of Hebrews, by the way, or I am of Cephas, that's Peter. Cephas is a, the Hebrew name. Um, Peter, same person. I, or I am of Christ. 
So the, the church, the the church was all the Christians in the city. See, our ideas of church, which is like a religious club, is not the same idea as the New Testament idea of church. So the the New Testament never speaks of the churches in a city. It always always speaks of the church because it is the community of all those who believe in Christ. But what was happening here in Corinth? They were dividing up into factions around their favorite teachers. Oh, I'm of Paul. Or I'm of, I'm of Apollos, who was apparently quite eloquent in his speech. Or I am of Peter, Cephas. Or I am of Christ, which is actually the correct answer. Although if you make it into a faction, then it's a problem too. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? See, the Christ is the correct answer. It is trust in Christ, not trust in Paul that saves you. Was Paul crucified for you? It's about Christ crucified. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. We're baptized into Jesus Christ. And when I, when I do a baptism, that I, I explicitly say that. I say, I baptize you in the, name of the, in the name or in the authority of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ. Because that's what baptism is about. Is it's, it's confession of your trust, your faith in Christ. And you're identifying yourself with Christ and his people. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Which is actually my name in Greek, by the way. Uh, besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So this sort of blows a hole right through sacramentarianism, or those denominations, Rome, Lutherans, Methodists to a degree, uh, somewhat Calvinists or Presbyterians, and some others that believe that we're actually saved and regenerated by sprinkling babies. Or, or uh, as Church of Christ, the baptizing adult believers, but it's the water that does it. It's the water that does it. It's the act that does it. No, no, that is a, a, uh, a, t a testimony to God's saving work in you. And, and, uh, to believe, you, you have to believe that Christ has saved you, that, God has, that, that you belong to him. Otherwise, you wouldn't be baptized. Infants don't need to be baptized, by the way. If there's a believing parent, well, they are regarded as by God as clean, at least until they come of an age where they're responsible for themselves, which was usually 12 or 13 in the, in the time of Christ, by the way. We talk about the age of responsibility or something like that. that there actually is a basis. Jesus was taken up to the temple when he was about 12 years old, uh, uh, and that was it. It would be what the Jews referred to as a bar mitzvah, coming of age, or for a girl, a bat mitzvah. Now, we don't have that in uh, English tradition so much. Others do, in a way. The Hispanics have, uh, uh, especially for uh, a, a girl, when she reaches that age, I forgot what they call it, um, but there's a celebration that she's becoming a, a, a woman and she is now at the age where she may begin to think about marriage. But that's, uh, you know, sometimes if we don't know the traditions that were behind some of these things, we don't really understand what's going on. For Christ did not send me to baptize. See, his priority was not in baptizing but to preach the gospel. It doesn't, didn't throw baptism out, but that's not the thing. You're not saved by being baptized. You're saved by responding to the message of the gospel, by believing it, by trusting in Christ. But to preach the gospel, not with wis the wisdom of words, 
not with eloquence and prepared messages that we figure out, oh, you know, I'll say it this way and everything else, using psychology and sociology and philosophy and the wisdom of the world. Lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. See, it has to be the power of God that saves someone. The Holy Spirit working in them, bringing conviction of sin, of righteousness and judgment, a, a conviction of the, of the truth that Christ was crucified for your sins, for my sin. You can't just teach someone that. I was taught all that stuff. I went through confirmation, three years, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, and then the, what sometimes is called a bishop, and Lutherans came around and they had a ceremony and we all confessed our faith and said the Apostles' Creed and renounced the world, the flesh, and the devil. <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing, but nevertheless, and, and we meant it, or I meant it, didn't save me didn't save me. I was uh, as unregenerate as ever, as selfish as ever, and it was uh, that was it. I was just consumed with myself, as every unregenerate person is. <clears throat> it's all about me. And we learn how to hide that and pretend that we're better than we are. But nevertheless, that's the truth. That's the real uh, effect of the fall of humanity. Uh, if Christ is not in us, we cannot do any good thing. Jesus said, only God is good. If God's not in you, you cannot do what's good. Not truly good. Not good in the sight of God. Because it's not done out of faith, not done out of true trust in him, it's not good. Which is why uh, in Proverbs, at least in the King James Version, it says, even the plowing of the wicked is sinful. Why? Because it's not done out of faith in God. It's not done out of godly motives. It's not done in the love of God. It is done for self. And that makes it sinful. The motive makes it sinful. Not the act, the motive. You can do what looks to be good, but you can do it out of selfish motives, and that makes it a sinful act. We are to lo the, the, the great commandments is a commandment of love. Jesus said, that's what's the greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, which comes from the Old Testament law. Notice these aren't one of the ten. Uh, the ten are just like the intro, the simple introduction. And the second, he said, is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, as much as you love yourself. That's God's law. He said, in those two commandments, all the law and the prophet a hang on those two. Everything else is interpretation and application of the commandments to love. But if God is not in you, you cannot do it because you're self-centered. And love is true love is never self-centered. That doesn't mean you don't necessarily take you 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 have concerns for yourself, but you also have concerns for others. It's not totally other-centered. It can't be. It's a, it's a relationship with God. Uh, love is not a noun. It's a verb. There, there, there has to be an object to love. It's uh, uh, Some of the ideas that we're given through theology and others and philosophy is just plain wrong. Ideas of God himself, that a lot of it is just from pagan sources like Aristotle. That, that has infiltrated Christianity, brought in by probably well-meaning converts that had a history and a background in philosophy. And they brought that stuff into the church because they thought they didn't think there was anything wrong with it. And, of course, it was attracted to the unregenerate, attractive. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that stuff before. They gravitate toward that rather than toward Christ himself. There's a separation, even within the church, between those that love God, who love Christ, and those who love the religion. It's tradition versus the reality of a relationship with Christ, with God in Christ. So the preaching, making converts through eloquent speech, 
or by appealing to people's carnal nature, like the seeker-sensitive movement is a perfect example of that, or, or whatever, that to get them into the church. Get them, they talk about churched versus unchurched. That's not what the Bible talks about. Are you in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ himself and in him with the Father or not? That's the issue. Have you been saved by the words of men or by the power of God? That's the issue. Once upon a time, evangelicalism pretty much could answer that in a correct way. Not anymore. For the message of the cross, see, this is why the seeker-sensitive people like Rick Warren and Bill Hables and others, uh, the prosperity gospel, which is all about the flesh, have removed the cross from their churches because the message of the cross is a scandal to the church, to the, to the world. Why? Because it says, you are so bad that the God had to send his son out to earth to die on a cross to atone for your wickedness, to make you acceptable to God. And God could not possibly have a relationship with you without that, because you are so bad. And God is so holy and good. So it's a scandal. People don't want to hear that they're bad, that they're sinners. Unless God has brought you to the place that he has shown you your sin. And then it's like, how can I be saved from myself? That's the issue. Sins are not just simply acts. The problem is you. You're where they come from, out of your heart, as Jesus said. For the message of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing. Those who are in the way of, of are on the way to perishing, the cross is foolishness to them. What's this nonsense? Internet, the internet, YouTube's full of people like this. You can find people that claim they were evangelical Christians. And they've rejected it. Well, they never knew Christ. They thought they were evangelical Christians. They knew the facts or believed it, sort of. They were taught things. But they did not have Christ in them. They may have uh, had a momentary response or for a short while. And then they fell away to the world because they're perishing. And you, you'll hear them talk about, oh, that Christ crucified is it's foolishness. Yeah, they're dying. They're on their way to hell. They have chosen to not believe, to reject the truth. And that's the judgment. The light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. They're unwilling to face their own sinfulness and come to God for his solution, which is Jesus Christ. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God. As it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent, those who are wise and prudent in the sight of, of the world. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe, the expert in Scripture? Where is the disputer, the debater of this age? You know, we've got people out there that style themselves Christian debaters. They're not proclaiming the gospel. They're trying to score points for themselves. It's really more about them than it, and beating the opponent. Some of these people are, well, what do you call a person that, that, that gets a thrill from destroying someone in an argument? It's a psychiatric disorder. Like, 
that, that they actually enjoy being able to, to uh, destroy somebody's belief system. Not because they love God. I can think of one person out there who was in prison, um, and he was would be called a sociopath. That he now instead of uh, doing what he did that put him in prison, which was beating his father with a hammer. They that he rather enjoys doing that using Christianity as a sledgehammer against Muslims. Well, I doubt it, and, and insults and all kinds of foul things. Uh, 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 see, he's not really proclaiming Christ. He is just trying to destroy their beliefs because he gets a thrill out of that. I can think of some other people that are self-styled pastors that do the same thing and debaters and elders. They enjoy what they do. They enjoy trying to make other people feel foolish and stupid. That is not proclaiming Christ. They never talk about their own sinfulness. And these people never talk about, about you know, their evil and how they found forgiveness and salvation in Christ. They're not promoting Christ. They end up promoting themselves. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer or debater of, the, of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? This is a very important statement. Verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, philosophy. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. Philosophia. Sophia is the Greek word for wisdom. And uh, Sophia, yeah, and Philo is, is a, a word for love, one of the Greek words for love, not eros. That's a different kind of love. That's called lust. Uh, <coughs> sexual desire. A philo is like sometimes called brotherly love, but that it's used, it's pretty generic. But the love of wisdom, philosophy, now, the philosophers, they, they, they love wisdom but they don't know God. So what does God say? That the world through its through wisdom did not know God. See, God himself here in Paul condemns the philosophy of the world as a way to understanding God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. King James, James says the foolishness of preaching. That's not really the best translation. It's the message of Christ crucified that's foolish to the world. Not preaching, not proclaiming, that's not the point. It is a particular, it's just it's not even a good translation of the Greek word there. It's the message proclaimed that's foolish here. Christ crucified for sinners. God in the flesh dying for the sins of his creatures. His body dying. God did not die as God. No. It's, it's, when we die, we don't go out of existence. Our body dies. Our spirit doesn't die. Our body does. Foolishness of the world. For since in the world... Um, uh, for the Jews seek for a sign. They're all the Jews were always looking for miracles. Prove it. And there's a lot of Christians that do the same thing. The entire charismatic movement, Pentecostal movement, is based on seeking after signs. It is. And power. That's what it's all about. That's how it began. Go back to the roots of some of thing to see what it really is. Charismatic movement or Pentecostal movement begins in the United the, uh, the current one begins in the United States in Texas and Oklahoma. I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but then it goes out to California and Azusa Street. But yeah, it began uh, with a homebrew Bible school by a rather odd character. 
uh, self-appointed. Uh, and he was asking his students what to sign. There was a, the whole thing. Was, What's the sign? The, the holiness movement uh, was had gone crazy and all over the place. It was all these different things. How, what's the sign of the being baptized in the Spirit? How do we know? How do we know? And his students said, actually, he asked his students to, to search the scriptures and tell him what the sign is. And they said, well, it's speaking in other tongues. No, that's a historic sign of one of the signs of the coming of the Holy Spirit that occurred at Pentecost. There was tongues of fire, too. Did they occur every time a person is filled with the Holy Spirit? No. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that speaking in, in uh, other languages would, would be a, a part of the demonstration of the Spirit of God's coming. But it was, it was, we find it repeated in the New Testament whenever the Holy Spirit comes to a different group. So it was first with the Jews, and then it goes to the Samaritans, and then it goes to the Gentiles. And you had people that were believers in Jesus that had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul didn't say, do you speak in tongues? No, he, he asked, have you been filled? But these, these, these were signs that, uh, of fulfillment of prophecy and signs attesting to the fact, uh, the fact that Jesus is the Messiah the son of the living God, who rose from the dead. They have a purpose, not just play things. Can God do these things today? Yes. Does he usually do these things today? No, no. Even in the, in the New Testament, we find uh, the miracles and stuff dying out. Because now, for example, prophecy and interpretation of tongues was originally there was no bible no te no new testament no written gospels no written epistles for us to look at the the faith delivered once for all unto the saints hadn't been completed so the holy spirit was directly communicating with the church with the churches we already have the words of the apostles now written all of us can read them at our desire. We don't need any new words. Those that say oh, you need a fresh word from God are serving Satan. And those that point you to man's theology rather than God's word are serving Satan too. Lest you think I'm picking on one side. The Jews request a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom, philosophy. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, a scandal. The word is uh, scandalon. It means something that, that causes you to stumble. It causes your faith to fail, for example. Jesus talked about woe to those who, who cause these little ones, these little children that believe in me to stumble to be scandalized, to lose their faith. He said it'd be better for that person to have a millstone hung around his neck and he'd be cast into the sea than to do that because of the consequences that person will experience for causing children, little children, to lose their faith in Christ. Warning to every teacher, every teacher that preaches lies like evolution, you will be held responsible by God. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, called by God, it is God who calls us to, to his son. To the Jew, uh, both to Jews and Greeks, Greeks in a generic sense is non-Jews, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the, will, uh, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Again, we're talking about the foolishness of the message preached. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh are called. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things that are mighty and the base things and the things that are despised. God has chosen. The, and the things that are not are nothing. To bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. In other words, nobody's going to be able to boast that I saved myself. It was me. God chose me because I'm so good and so strong and so wise and whatever. No, God rejects you for that. He's not going to, he doesn't want people that can boast. But people that know they're nothing and foolish and weak. That people have nothing to boast in because they know what they truly are but rather boast in Christ and what he did on the cross for us. God has chosen the foolish things of this world. Things like me. But of him, by him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. The Jesus for us who are in Christ, he is our wisdom and Righteousness and sanctification. He is our righteousness. And he is our sanctification, our being set apart to God. So that's what sanctify means, to be set apart to God's use. As it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Everybody that's been saved by God knows it was God that did it. If you think, oh, no, I did this and I did that, you haven't been saved yet. Otherwise, you'd know enough not to boast in your flesh. The flesh is what the, our enemy, not our friend. Okay, so what I want to talk about, now that I've done the most important part, 47 minutes, thank God I spent it preaching Christ. I, I visited a, uh, a small Baptist church a couple weeks ago. Uh, not too far from here, a little town, um, it's actually in the same school district, uh, a little town uh, that has, oh, about 200 people. And the ba a Baptist church, a lot of the, the communities around here, when the railroads went through back in around 19, 1851 through 1853, they would set up, they, they'd portion out a little area along your right of way for a town. So they, they wanted these towns every so many miles uh, because their their uh, market was the farmers. It was transporting material. Uh, ev everything was about agriculture. It was all about agriculture, transporting supplies to the farmers and produce back to the cities. That's what the railroads made their money on. So they needed this ever so often because when you're transporting by wagon and horse... Well, you don't want to travel too far because a 10-mile uh, a journey might be uh, a full day. So you you got to be reasonably close to get into town and to, to haul to market. So you'd bring your, your produce to market, and then it would travel by train to places like Chicago. <clears throat> So that was that was this area here. So this was one of these little towns, a couple hundred people, um, and they had a, you know a post office and whatever, some stores and a, maybe an implement dealership every once in a while, and a, a, a church. This one was so small it only had one church. There's usually several churches in these towns. Uh, often around here, there's almost always a Methodist church. Uh, there, uh, this is a lot of a lot of churches of Christ around here, and uh, Baptist churches, and this town had a little Baptist church. I think it's founded in 1853, so that's about the time the railroad came through, and uh, probably you know one of the first things they'd put up is they'd have, they'd have as a church, because that also brought uh, these towns were centers for all the the farmers in the area. And this church was not an old building anymore. It's most, most of those buildings didn't last that long. This, this building uh, was built, I would say, about 1970-ish. So it was a modern-style building, uh, typical for Baptists. Um, I think it was a brick or stone type of uh, building. 
uh, single level, sensible, uh, relatively plain, but attractive. Typical Baptist style. Uh, nothing ornate, but attractive wood, wood pews, nice, everything nice, nice and simple and clean and attractive. Uh, practical, no flight of stairs. You'd have to carry people up <laughs> in the ice in the winter to get the elderly up into the building. No, none of that's foolishness. Uh, handicapped, accessible by design. Didn't have to make any modifications for that. So it was a um, relatively uh, new building. I went over there. I was not expecting what I saw. I got there, and the place is packed. And it wasn't a special event. Uh, the the parking lot was absolutely filled. The cars were down the street and around the corner. Uh, these are not streets. Uh, so the streets on the main street, pretty much. But around the corner, you're on a very narrow thing, and you end up parking half your vehicle in somebody's yard. And there was a, about a dozen vehicles around the corner, and I was one of them. I didn't want to get there too early. I just wanted to visit and get a spot near the back, just in case I felt the need to leave, and which sometimes happens, like it did last weekend in a different church. But... So they, I, had, I had done some research ahead of time, and they had a, a new pastor. Um, he was a, a middle-aged. He had recently graduated from seminary in a local independent evangelical seminary not too far from here. And I uh, thought, well, that could be good. You know, second career. He would retired from something over at the University of uh, Champaign. And I believe, and so he was took on a second career, decided he wanted to go into ministry. That can be good. Can be good. Um, this is not an independent Baptist church. It's a member of what's something, American Baptist, whatever they're currently calling themselves. They keep changing the name. It was originally Northern Baptist back uh well, this actually goes back to the Baptists before the split caused by the uh, Civil War. So <laughs> back when Illinois was was uh, uh, the the Western fringe in a lot of ways, uh, just uh, still not completely settled. Again, the railroad tracks, the railroads were coming through. Uh, that um, was an amazing thing for a lot of people. But uh, so it, it's not a uh, uh, it's not independent fundamentalist. It's not Southern Baptist. I thought, well, you know, the, the denomination is pretty weak, which is I think is good. <laughs> Baptists should not pay attention to denominations at all. So I go there thinking, hey, this might be good. This might be good. I wasn't going there neg with a negative thing. And I, so I get there. And it became obvious pretty quickly uh, that this guy didn't know what the heck he's doing. He he said that he had had a, a, like four failed sermons in his file cabinet. Why would you ever even have a you know? So in other words, these are pre-written, pre-composed sermons. And he was wasn't sure, quite should say. Well, it was a good sermon. I don't know why it didn't go over. <laughs> I thought I'd try it again. You know, like, let's see if I can doctor it up a little bit. Well, that's not a good sign. So you're going to give this congregation a failed sermon, failed by your own standard, because people didn't like it. So your standard is whether, not whether something is the truth, not whether it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, but whether it appeals to the congregation. Bad sign, bad sign. Oh boy, where is this going to go? And I'll, I won't even talk about the sermon. He, so the sermon end up mostly about funny stories about him and his wife. Lots of laughs. I ran into that a week ago at another church. Nothing but laughter. They, they had a guy there who was basically a comedian. That A church that I was familiar with be, uh, and had a younger guy there. The pastor is now quite elderly and obviously couldn't handle a regular sermon. But the guy was just nothing but a choker at this other church. I'm like, really? I actually walked out about 10 minutes of that sermon. I got grabbed my coat and walked out. Uh, I know the pastor there. I know know that, that church quite well. It was used to be just two blocks up the street. Assembly of God. And this shows you 
you know, the, the decline. As, as the Assemblies of God, I would say, are the most evangelical and sound element in the Pentecostal movement. They were they're Baptistic, so they they are basically Baptists that also believe in the gifts of the Spirit. A lot of times in this area of the country, um, you could you can't tell one from a Baptist church. Uh, this particular church, I never recall hearing anybody speak in tongues in the worship service. It was originally not Assembly of God Church, too. It was something else. Uh, and uh, they just got an Assembly of God preacher some like 40 years ago, and the guy's still wandering around. I actually ran into him there, and I hadn't seen him for quite a while. But the, back to this Baptist church. So this guy's wheeling out a, def a failed sermon by his own account. And trying to doctor it up to 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 make it acceptable. It's like why? What's it about? But in the in the uh, when I can't really remember what it's about. But in the beginning, before this, he spent a lot of time talking about the difficulty in renting a camel. And I'm talking about the collapse of evangelicalism. So this church, in fact, I saw a sign for it the other day. They're having a, a live nativity scene. Now, uh, Church of Christ, when I was at Bismarck, had one too. The largest church in that little town, which is slightly larger than this town here I'm talking about. But it was the same thing with the creation of the railroads. And uh, uh, they're on sort of a main track north to south here. But this one uh, is on a defunct section of railroad track now. But they... Uh, so he's spending a lot of time talking about the difficulty in trying to rent animals for their live nativity. And I'm thinking, what does that have to do with Jesus Christ? What does a live nat nativity have to do with Jesus Christ? It's seeker sensitive. It's just like ice cream socials. This was, like, we're going back in time before it's seeker sensitive. Traditions in these churches, ice cream socials. So they'd get uh, people would come together. They'd have a it's sort of like a community introduction to our church. Come here, we'll have you can get some free ice cream and maybe a piece of cake. <laughs> Anything with free food will bring a crowd out. But why are they coming? Why are they coming? Are they coming here to, to, to uh, meet the pastor and, and hear about uh, uh, what the church preaches and you know, why you should come here, maybe? No, that's not usually what it's about. How do I know that? Because I was a pastor at one of those churches uh, for a while, for a couple of years. Then I realized they're not really serious. They, they were Christians by tradition. Most of them were not Christians because of God's work in them. I didn't think. I didn't think. Am I infallible in something like that? No. No, and the fact that I was saved out of such a terrible deep hole, uh, I probably have higher expectations than maybe I should because I know how much God had to do in me and still is doing in me. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's, just, it's like hardly perfect. But when, when God has, has brought you out of, you know, when you've been walking on the edge of, of the pit of hell, and God saves you out of that, saves you out of not only uh, uh, addiction, but actual demon possession. Uh, you, you realize, you know the reality of God and, and the, the gospel. Even though sometimes you may get caught up in this world, uh, you still get, you, you just maybe expect other people to have that same reality, and maybe that's not right. But nevertheless, so there, he was going on and on about I have been trouble uh, trouble finding a camel to rent. <sighs> what does that have to do with the birth of Jesus? What is Christmas a celebration of? We've forgotten. Now, this should be what's in the category of what's called an evangelical church. There aren't any Baptists that are not evangelical in some sense. It's supposed to be about the gospel, about uh, conversion, about salvation, about being born again. I don't know of any Baptists that aren't about that, except Reformed Baptists, and they're a different entity altogether. 
Uh, but yeah, it's about God, even them, they talk about the, the reality of, of conversion and God's work in you, that God is necessary. And that's why there's a division between Baptists and Churches of Christ, because Churches of Christ are rationalists, or were originally, and they didn't believe in the necessity of a supernatural work of God. You just had to do five things. It was all about your works and what you did, which is why the Baptists rejected them. The Campbellites, it's all about that, that, those, those churches of Christ, about five things that man does. Hears the gospel, believes the gospel, uh, repents of his sins, is baptized for the remission of sins. Yeah, it's washes your, your sin is washed away in the water and then lives the Christian life. So they have zero security of salvation. They know nothing of the Holy Spirit. In fact, some of them, even the mention of the Holy Spirit could get you kicked out of the church. It depends. They're independent, supposedly. But yeah, they, they don't believe uh, historically in the necessity of a supernatural work. That completely separates you from Baptists. All Baptists originally believe that. And should currently. But so, so I'm like, what? What is going on here? Again, a, a, a living nativity scene is not unusual. Why are you doing it? Does it point people to Jesus? Not at all. It points people to animals. Oh, we have sheep. We got a goat. We had a cow. And oh, we had a, the best one around. We found a camel. So the other day I looked uh, at, there's only one gospel that mentions manger. <clears throat> Let me actually look it up here. It's a gospel of Luke. So, and here's a typical uh, nativity scene supposedly taken from the scriptures. So in, in Luke uh, uh, chapter 2 is where you'll find the account. And, and Luke's account is uh, really the most complete. O only Luke and, and Matthew mention the birth itself. And Luke here is the one that mentions uh, uh, that you shall find the babe wrapped in a manger. This is, this is the angel's words to the shepherds. Right here, it actually it kind of starts a little earlier, but here. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Oh, this also can be translated as crib. But uh, so it's a manger is a, a uh, like a wooden trough that's generally used where you'd put animal feed rather than on the ground where it'll be trampled. So you put fodder for uh, grazing type animals and horses in a uh, trough, uh, a simple thing usually. Uh, wouldn't be elaborate woodwork, just something to hold it up or a some sort of a crib structure that, that would hold feed off the floor. That's the main thing for the animals to eat. Uh, this could typically have been a cave, especially in uh, uh, the area of Nazareth. But there was an inn or a guest room. The, not necessarily a complex inn, but a, a, a sort of a, a public. It could have very well, the idea of inn is not incompatible with this. Because there, there's not room in the inn. That's what uh, we find in, in Luke. So they they had to find shelter outside where they would normally stay. They were there to register in Bethlehem for a tax, a census-based tax <clears throat> that uh, the Roman emperor was requiring. And this, this would take periods over a period of years, by the way, and it'd go in cycles through areas because it was a big thing. People had to, to leave where they were currently staying and go to the, the area, of the, the place where they were born. So they uh, went to Bethlehem, the city of David, because they were both from there, both Joseph and Mary. And it says, uh, so we have this account, and the angel or the, the uh, angels announce the the, uh, the fact that the Messiah has been born. 
And the shepherds said, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, in other words, in a hurry. They, they left the flocks. They were out there probably watching over the flocks when the time, time of sheep uh, would be giving birth, because that's when they would be most vulnerable to predators. So to, to take care of the lambs or any complications that might arise in birth, uh, farmers often have to do that. Something gets, uh, animal doesn't come out the normal way and they have to do a repositioning and uh, in order to save the animals. And they're out there watching over the, the, the flocks by night, which probably meant it wasn't in January or the end of February, by the way. Because it does get cold in that area, especially in the Bethlehem area. You're up fairly high. There is snow in Jerusalem, uh, not unusually. It's not heavy snows, but it does snow in that area. And Bethlehem is just a, oh, a few miles, I don't know, like 10 miles or less south of Jerusalem in the high ridge in the center of the country. Jerusalem's up in elevation, of course. You go up to Jerusalem, it's not anywhere near sea level. And so they, 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 they found Mary and Joseph and the babe laying in a manger. In other words, keep at some place off the ground. And when they had seen him, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. In other words, they revealed to Joseph and Mary what the angels had said. And all those that heard, the, heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen. And then it goes into eight days later, later they bring Jesus up to the temple, which is relatively close. It would, it would be a good day's journey, but it was uh, certainly uh, not a, um, too far from Bethlehem. Uh, for for him to be circumcised because they were required the boys were required to be circumcised on the eighth day. And Jesus had to fulfill all that is written in the law. He had to fulfill the law in order to die for our sins, to be the spotless, sinless offering. So if you think Jesus sinned, well then you don't have a sacrifice. You don't have an atonement. If you think that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you have no Savior. All well, those things are necessary. The, the resurrection is the testimony of God that Jesus accomplished what he came to do, which is to die for the sins of the world. He didn't come to primarily come to do miracles and teach. He came to be God's atonement for the sins of the world. In, to an order for, for God to reconcile the world to himself. God had to take sin and off the table by atoning for it. Otherwise, God could not possibly fulfill his purpose of dwelling in humanity. As Christians, we have still have sin in our mortal bodies. The Holy Spirit could not dwell in us in that circumstance. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was with people, but not in them. Not couldn't take up permanent residence in us. Only after the cross, that's why it's at Pentecost, Christ fulfilled the purpose. He presented his offering to God as the atonement for sins. And only after that could the new covenant come into effect, which includes the gift of the Holy Spirit, along with other things. So, the where do we find animals? Where do we find camels? Where do we find goats and sheep and cows? Which is part of every nativity scene, right? We don't. All they do is illustrate it was a animal shelter. It doesn't mention the presence of any animals. The scriptures don't. It's only Luke that mentions a manger. Because there was no room in the end. It's just sort of a, the, the, it has to do with the prophecies that talk about Jesus coming in humility, not coming as a, as a king in glory from heaven. 
but rather being born, born under humble circumstances to humble people, even though they were descendants of the royal lineage. Joseph was a, a, a technician, a, uh, you know, we often think of a carpenter. He could have been a stone cutter. Uh, a technoton is a, uh, I might have that word a little bit wrong, but that is a, uh, a skilled worker, a, uh, a, skill, a person with a skilled craft. So uh, a carpenter certainly could be a carpenter, but the scripture doesn't actually say that. It's a, it uses a word that talks about somebody that works with their hands in a particular skill. A uh, construction skill, basically. So that's uh, what he was doing. He uh, and they went to Nazareth, and there was a Herod had lots of building projects up there. Uh, so uh, anyway, there was no animals even mentioned, other than the fact there's a, a manger, which is a device for animal feed. So why would a church go to all the difficulty and all the expense? of having a live nativity, unless you have the living Jesus Christ there, what does it do? It's a distraction. It's a distraction. The people come to see the animals. They don't come to worship Jesus. It's anti-Christ because it takes the focus off Christ, just like Santa Claus is anti-Christ, because it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, just like the, the vast marketing enterprise that has Christmas has become. It is a distraction from Christ. It is from Satan, who wants to keep your eyes off of God sending a Savior into this world. So why would a church, a Baptist church, do such a foolish thing because of the collapse of evangelicalism. We no longer recognize in this country what the gospel is all about. We've forgotten about salvation from sin, especially since the rise of the seeker-sensitive movement and people like Rick Warren, who was a Baptist or is a Baptist or some form. See, it's not about, like Rick Warren and his purpose-driven life and purpose-driven church garbage. Those people, and Bill Hybels and the others in that movement, didn't talk about saved and unsaved. They talked about churched and unchurched. In other words, do you come and attend our clubs? Are you present in our buildings? It has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And because the, the, the cross, the preaching of the cross, is foolishness to the world. What do the churches in that do? They seek to get rid of the cross. Just like Pope Francis seeks to eliminate the Mass. Because what does the Mass testify? From the beginning of Christianity, what's it about? One of the few relics in Roman Catholicism that's right even though it's got a lot of bad doctrine around it. It's about Christ dying for the sins of the world. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. What was he about to do that very day? Die on that cross. This is the blood of the new covenant, the cup of wine. And took the bread. This is my body that is given for you, broken for you, giving a new and full meaning to the Jewish celebration of Passover. When God delivers his people out of the world, the world of Egypt, out of the world of idolatry, out of the world of sin, and separates them onto himself to become his church, which Stephen uses the word ecclesia, about the church in the wilderness, called out by God to himself to be his people. And God providing an atonement for our sins that we might be his people and receive his new covenant. Rather than focus on Christ and the cross, Christ's birth to go die on the cross, there, there is a wonderful um, ancient painting, or probably Renaissance era or shortly thereafter, where there's a painting of, of Christ in the manger with light coming through a window, you know, modern kind of window in a way, and it projecting a shadow of a cross across Christ and the manger, the crib there, as a 
you know, a, a reminder that Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of the world. That has to be the focus. Christ crucified. If that is what evangelicalism is about, proclaiming the gospel of Christ crucified for our sins. And when we forget that and substitute nonsense, we are not serving Christ, but we're serving the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it is madness that evangelicals have forgotten the gospel and substituted the things of this world for it. No longer understand what it means to even gather together in Christ's name. But think it's just coming to church, being part of an organization of some sort of religious club. What is going to happen when Christ comes in judgment? Jesus said that in that day, will he find, he asked the question, will the Son of Man find the faith? That's how it should be translated to the faith on the earth. Today, if Jesus Christ walked into your church, would he stay or would he turn around and walk out? Or would your church walk him to the door? because he might not be respectable. What if he came as a homeless man to your church? If Jesus came appearing as a homeless man, what do you think the odds are that he would be recognized for who he is? Just a thought, since we're entering into the Christmas season. We're already in it, if you're one of the churches that, that celebrate the, uh, the, 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 the four candle thing, five candle thing, in that season. We're already in that season. Would you recognize Christ if he came to your church? Or would you reject him? Because you're not there for Christ. You're there for other reasons. Something we should all ask ourselves. <laughs>